the upper 20s. It's 30 degrees right now in Charlotte. This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. Nominating someone to serve on the Supreme Court is a president's opportunity to make a mark on our nation and the administration of its laws in ways that will long outlast that presidency. When running for office, candidate Joe Biden promised if given an opportunity, he would nominate a black woman to the high court. With Justice Stephen Breyer's announcement of his intention to retire at the end of this term, that opportunity has arrived, and President Biden is said to be considering four black women as potential nominees. But that isn't the only way he may impact the court. Biden appointed a Supreme Court commission to advise on whether to make changes to the makeup of the court in response, at least in part, to the obstruction of President Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland, followed by former President Trump placing three justices on the court and tilting the balance in a direction some view as not being in step with the country. We look at all of that this hour with three people who know the high court, how it operates, and its history well. Christina Rodriguez is a professor of law at Yale Law School, whose research includes constitutional law and theory, and she's also the co-chair of that presidential commission on the United States Supreme Court. Welcome to the program. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Michael Klarman is professor of legal history at Harvard Law School. He is also the author of several books on the high court, including From Jim Crow to Civil Rights, The Supreme Court and the Struggle for Racial Equality, and The Framers Coup, The Making of the United States Constitution. And he joins us this morning from Harvard. Good morning. Morning, Mike. And Adam Liptek covers the Supreme Court for the New York Times, an attorney. He's taught courses on the Supreme Court at several law schools, and his reporting made him a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Thank you for being here as well. Good morning. Great to be here. Michael, let me begin with you. Let's start with a little history. You're the historian on the panel. And for most of the Supreme Court's history, it has been populated by white, middle-aged, or older men. And in recent years, women were added to the court. There have even been a few black justices on the high court, but there has never been a black female justice. And some see this as an opportunity to open up the court and its deliberations to a different point of view, a different mindset, a different set of experiences. So when you look back on the history of the court and at the decisions they have made, were those decisions influenced or changed in any way, any way by the race, creed, or color of the people sitting on the bench? Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that they have been one of the most infamous decisions in the history of the Supreme Court is the Dred Scott case where the court said both that Congress did not have the power to regulate slavery in foreign territories and that African-Americans, even if free, could not be citizens under the constitution. Uh, certainly if there had been a black person on the Supreme Court, they might've dissented. That was a decision that was a time when the court was divided uh, re uh, along regional lines and along partisan lines. So the decision was a seven to two decision with the Democrats all in the majority and the, uh, the two dissenting justices were Whigs or Republicans. And it was also a decision that divided the court along regional lines. At one point it appeared that the five Southerners and the four Northerners would disagree on the question of Congress's power over slavery in the territories. There've been 115 justices in history, 110 of them were men, 112 of them were white. Uh, anybody who thinks that it's not time to diversify the court, I think is not uh, being cognizant of that history. And I don't see any reason why Joe Biden shouldn't have made a promise during the campaign that he would appoint an African-American woman. Uh, black women are the backbone of the Democratic Party, by some estimates, they vote 98% Democratic. And in some Southern states like Alabama, they were almost single-handedly responsible for Democratic wins, for example, in the 2017 Senate race. And we'll talk more about this as we go through the program, but the, the, the liberals are in the minority now on the court, and he will obviously appoint a black woman who is a moderate or a liberal or a progressive or some, however you want to describe it. But if she brings her perspective to the court, how much impact might she have given her minority status, the status of, of, of progressives being in the minority on the court? 
Um, I would think almost zero influence over her fellow justices. I think it's important to understand, first of all, she should be a liberal um, rather than a moderate. This is the most conservative court in the last hundred years. There's no reason why Democrats shouldn't appoint people who are further to the left of the political spectrum. But the justices don't influence each other uh, very often or to a very large degree. Um, occasionally having Thurgood Marshall in the room might enable him to tell some stories, uh, to share some perspectives that none of the white justices have. Uh, same thing with Justice Sotomayor, same thing with the first women on the court, Justice O'Connor, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, they might be able to introduce their colleagues to a perspective that they otherwise would not, would not sympathize with, but there's very little influence going on. The justices mostly have a particular set of ideological views and perhaps a particular set of methodological views. They form their own opinions on abortion, the death penalty, campaign finance reform, affirmative action. They're not being very much influenced by their colleagues. They're not even being very much influenced by the lawyers who are arguing cases. Occasionally, the justices behind the scenes will do some lobbying, some campaigning among each other. So Chief Justice Roberts clearly changed his vote to be the fifth justice to uphold the Affordable Care Act. Clearly, and there clearly was a bargain made in that case behind the scenes with Justice Kagan and Justice Breyer. Some of that goes on, but that's being done for strategic reasons. It's not because one justice influences the other uh, because they have bring a new perspective. It's rather that somebody wanted to make a deal. So Christina Rodriguez, let me get your take on this because uh, he's going to, President Biden is going to appoint a black female justice, no, no matter what. Yeah, I think he's under, he's considering four at the moment, possibly more, but it will end up being that person. Justice Breyer, who is retiring to make the seat available, uh, was considered by many to be pragmatic and somebody who was willing to talk through things and negotiate behind the scenes with other justices. Uh, can we anticipate that even if this person tries to do that, she will have any influence because he's been there a long time and she will just be arriving? I think it's unlikely, as Professor Klarman suggested, that the new justice will have influence that produces compromise. But I think it's not because she will be a new justice, but because she will be one of three in a minority of progressives or, or liberals or, or left of center justices. And there's not that much compromising to be done. I think that the hope instead should be that whoever is appointed has a voice that will lead to the articulation of constitutional principles, perspectives that in dissent when necessary might uh, speak either to the public or help shape the arc of the law over time. There have been justices who've been in the minority who've written strong dissents who over time have uh, been able to shape the court, but that has as much to do with the way uh, the political process yields new justices and shifts the balance of the court. It's not the power of the individual per se, but an individual in dissent can lay a groundwork for, for future change. But we're talking about change that's you know, 10, 20, 30 years in the future. It has been argued, Adam, uh, that uh, adding a black female justice to the court will infuse it with institutional legitimacy by allowing the court to more accurately reflect the, uh, the views of the public, because they're saying now that the court is out of step with the majority of the public because of the appointment of three justices by President Trump, who are to the right, uh, and because of the refusal of then Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to even hold hearings on President Obama's appointment of Merrick Garland uh, to the bench. So will the addition of this black female justice be influential in the court's decision-making process in the near future, in the medium term future, or will it simply being allowed another voice to be ignored? Uh, so I, I agree with uh, Professors Rodriguez and Carmen that putting another liberal onto the three member liberal minority will do essentially nothing to shape the direction of the Supreme Court. And while I think all Americans should welcome uh, diversity on the Supreme Court, that too will not make a, a meaningful difference. Uh, but the, the premise of the second half of your question is really important to dwell on. We've been through a period now where uh, Donald Trump 
following the Republican blockade of Merrick Garland uh, and including the rush nomination of Amy Coney Barrett, substituting a very conservative justice for a liberal icon, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, has fundamentally reshaped the Supreme Court. So I've covered the court since 2008. And for almost all my time, for all my time there, it's been fundamentally a conservative court. But Justice Anthony Kennedy was the swing justice for most of that time. And then Chief Justice Roberts briefly. And you had the sense, and I think the American public had the sense that the outcomes in the cases were not pre-cooked, that there were opportunities for advocacy and deliberation and that's not the uh, that's not the look of the current Supreme Court. So is that why people are concerned about the institutional legitimacy of the court? And do those concerns simply come from politicians uh, and people at high levels? Or, or do, are you hearing that kind of conversation about this being a legitimate body from ordinary rank and file Americans? The polling numbers are tanking. The Supreme Court's approval rating has dropped precipitously. Now, to be fair, the competition doesn't look so great either. The presidency, <laughs> Congress, journalists, lawyers, academics, but nonetheless, public confidence in the Supreme Court, and I would say particularly following uh, over the summer, the court's decision to allow Texas's six week abortion ban to come into effect, although it's plainly at odds with Supreme Court precedent, really gave the public the sense that this is a different and more muscular conservative court. Christina, Chief Justice uh, John Roberts, as uh, Adam Liptak just said, um, has often come over to the side of liberals and been the, 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 the person who's trying to moderate, being a moderating influence on the appearance of what the court may be. And there are some who believe that what will, what, what, what will be needed in this new nominee is a Roberts whisperer somebody who uh, rather than simply standing on principles and voting her way, will try to convince Roberts to come over to their side and moderate the court's opinions. What are your thoughts on that? I tend to think that Roberts is the one who does the whispering and is not the one who's <laughs> going to be whispered to. Uh, but as we've been discussing it, it doesn't much matter anymore given the six to three majority that the conservatives have on the court. And so in, you know, in the most recent decision on the Voting Rights Act, Robert sided with the three liberals and said, we're not going to allow these maps that the state of Alabama created that dilute Black votes to go into uh, effect. And it, that is a stunning uh, conclusion from Roberts, who has been a leader in um, minimizing the power of the Voting Rights Act. And yet, he couldn't get anyone else to come along with him. He was in a, major, a minority of, of four. And so I think that trying to find someone who's going to be able to speak to him um, might be helpful in the sense of, do you have more five, four votes with Robert siding with three liberals? That might heighten the public sense that something is really awry. Uh, and maybe that would lead to some kind of long-term effect like people voting on the Supreme Court um, in the next election and taking that into account more than they already do, which is, as we know, is not uh, common on the left, is more common on the right. And, and perhaps it might create further fertile political ground for Supreme Court reform um, if that continues to happen. I only have 10 seconds, but is Roberts making those moves when he makes them because he's concerned about the image of the court? I do think so. I think Roberts does care about the institutional legitimacy of the court, but he's also uh, quite conservative. Uh, so he's playing uh, both sides. We have to take a break. We're coming right back with more in a moment at Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Tryon Medical Partners, an independent practice with physicians in 10 specialty areas providing care at locations across the Charlotte region. Tryon Medical Partners, more at tryonmed.com. Well, here's a question for you. Can an app improve traffic safety? Well, Charlotte intends to find out. The city is testing a smartphone app 
that provides drivers with real-time information communi com communicated from traffic lights, other drivers, and pedestrians. We're going to learn more about this little project. And then, with our Democracy in Crisis, a play arrives in town exploring one of our founding documents. What the Constitution means to me is funny and entertaining, but it also takes you places you never thought you'd go. And we will hear from the playwright of what the Constitution means to me, which opens tomorrow night at the night, tomorrow on this program at 9. Black Profiles, presented by listener-funded public radio 90.7 WFAE. In 1992, native Charlotte and Dr. Donna Benson made history when she became the first black woman to serve as interim chancellor at North Carolina Central University, a historically black college and university. The UNC Board of Governors passed a resolution thanking her for her inspired leadership, and in 1995, they asked her to be the interim chancellor at Fayetteville State University, making her the first female chancellor at that HBCU. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're talking about who the well, well, the impact of the next possible nominee to the Supreme Court will be, and also about the President's Commission on the Supreme Court, which was co-chaired by Christina Rodriguez, one of our guests today. She's a professor of law at the Yale University Law School. Adam Liptak joins us. He's a journalist reporting on the Supreme Court for, New for the New York Times. And Michael Klarman is a professor of legal history at Harvard Law School. A and Michael, we've been talking about justices making surprise decisions or coming over to the other side in certain uh, decisions. How often in our history have justices who were presumed to be liberal or conservative turned out to render opinions that uh, buck those descriptions and expectations? Well, there have been lots of nominees who didn't turn out the way the presidents who appointed them would have liked. So for example, uh, President Eisenhower famously said that two of the biggest damn fool decisions of his presidency were sitting on the Supreme Court. That was Earl Warren and, and William Brennan. A whole string of Republican appointed justices beginning in the 1970s, uh, Harry Blackman, John Paul Stevens, David Souter, uh, even Lewis Powell, Anthony Kennedy, turned out either to be much more moderate or in the case of someone like Blackman or Stevens or Souter, liberal. So uh, in the past, justices have not always turned out the way the presidents who nominated them hoped. However, there's no reason to think that that's likely to continue into the future. Uh, the whole process of Supreme Court appointments has changed dramatically in the last 50 years. Uh, the presidents on the right now are only picking people who've been in the Federalist Society for their entire lives, and Democratic presidents are also being very careful. So I wouldn't expect a lot of surprises. Sometimes in individual cases, justice was, justices will also flip sides, often making strategic calculations. And this dates all the way back to the great Chief Justice John Marshall, who arguably in his last half decade on the court was retreating under political pressure from the Andrew Jackson administration. The court in the, fam in the 1930s famously switched sides in the face of court packing. There were similar retreats in the late 1950s and the 19 late 1960s on the crime issue. So the justices are very political actors. They understand that there's a limit to how far they can go in running counter to public opinion without suffering consequences. Adam, there's been much talk about this black woman who will take this job on the Supreme Court and the fact that she will bring with her much needed and absent uh, life experiences, heretofore absent life experiences to the court. But the court is supposed to make decisions about uh, whatever they're considering based on the constitution and on the law. So why should a judge's life experience influence those decisions? It's impossible for anyone to put aside their prior experiences, uh, their life experiences, their political views. It's got to inform some of your thinking. Now, to be sure you're bound by the legal text, uh, you're bound by precedent, but these are often open textured things. The words of the constitution are quite vague and they have to be filled with something. And that means people bring with them uh, how, what, what they have lived through. And I don't think this is controversial. I remember Justice Scalia, the famous leading conservative 
saying that just being in the room with Justice Thurgood Marshall, the civil rights hero who argued Brown against Board of Education, that Thurgood didn't have to say a word. And everyone would look at the case about race a little differently because they were looking at it through his eyes. And I think something similar is likely to happen at the margins uh, when we have, if we have, when we have a, a black woman Supreme Court justice. That brings me to my next question, Christina, because with the appointment of a black female, there will be no men in the liberal wing of the Supreme Court. So when and if uh, they take up affirmative action, if they take up, uh, they take further action on Roe v. Wade, with all the majority, with all of the minority justices being women, if they lose that argument or those arguments, what will that mean? How will that look? I, I think we can't forget that there's also a woman who's likely to be in the majority, Justice Amy Coney Barrett. And I think she was chosen in part because she was a, a woman and would change a little bit of the political valence of decisions that undermine or overturn decisions like Roe versus Wade. Um, I, I do think it's uh, quite apart from what the outcomes of the court's decisions will be exciting that you will have that many women on the court, that we have a five, four male, female split. Um, but I also think that what it underscores is that someone's background will not necessarily determine whether they're progressive or conservative, uh, left of center, right of center. I, I think there's no question that uh, Clarence Thomas's background growing up in the segregated South and poor uh, has a, been, had an enormous impact on the way he approaches questions across the board, including questions like affirmative action. They just don't, in his mind, resolve in the way that, that progressive or, or progressives or liberals would always want them to, to resolve. And so thinking about the effect of background is actually quite complicated. But in the end, I don't think the fact that there are three women in likely to be consistent dissenters in six to three decisions is, is bad for, for women's equality or for women on the court. I, I think it, it actually helps to normalize the idea of, of women on the court. There are just three justices in, in minority. Adam Liptak, more than a few Republicans have said uh, unsavory things in some people's minds about the possible uh, nomination of a black female justice. Senator Ted Cruz has called the promise to nominate a black woman offensive and insulting. Mississippi Senator Roger Wicker characterized it as a racially discriminatory quota. Senator Josh Hawley of uh, Missouri said basically the same thing. And when asked about President Reagan's promise to pick a woman uh, on the Supreme Court, who turned out to be Sandra Day O'Connor, he dismissed it as ancient history. This morning, it was reported that uh, uh, Senator uh, Lindsey Graham from South Carolina is seemingly on board with this nomination. So which is the better politics? To, to be against th this nominee because it's going to be a black woman and it's going to be a liberal and it's going to be a democratic president's nominee or to get on board because it looks better? Well, there are, there are arguments to be made on both sides. Uh, for starters, the Reagan analogy is very powerful. If Ronald Reagan can say, the court is missing an element of diversity, I'm going to appoint the first woman to the Supreme Court, turns out to be Sandra Day O'Connor and everyone applauds We've established the idea that this is a perfectly legitimate way to go about things. And in essence, there has been the opposite quota for the vast bulk of our history when only white men were eligible. So the critique doesn't strike me as particularly powerful. As for the politics of it, sure. I mean, the, the country is polarized across many dimensions, including racially. And there is an element of the public that can easily be appealed to by saying this is a kind of version of affirmative action, which uh, that part of the public is against. So that's one kind of politics. Lindsey Graham is a, is a complicated case. He is in favor of one of the nominees from his home state. And he has voted, he voted for Sotomayor, he voted for Kagan, which uh, he likes to talk about. But in fact, Lindsey Graham is a little bit of the old school Senator who used to say the president has the right to appoint someone who is qualified, end of story, and I will support that person, and I'm not going to get into this political uh, fight. Uh, that model of senator seems to be on the, on the decline. I, could I add something? Yes, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. I, what's offensive and insulting is not that President Biden has said he's going to nominate a black woman. 
but that Senator Cruz and Senator Wicker and the others are suggesting that this is race-based affirmative action and is somehow unconstitutional. Uh, during the Trump administration, 86% of the appointees um, were, were white and 73 or 74% of them were men. Why wasn't that affirmative action when 115 justices who have sat on the court, 110 of them were men and 112 of them were white? Why is that not unconstitutional affirmative action? Um, the idea that, that this is somehow a racial quota or race discrimination, this is just part of a general ploy by the Republican Party to look for opportunities to sow racial resentment. This is like pretending that critical race theory is being taught in schools when it's not. And this is like former President Trump running around saying that black people can get vaccinated and white people can't, which of course is a lie. This is part of a conscious political strategy, which has been part of the Republican playbook for the last 60 years, which is to try to convince white working class uh, Americans to desert the New Deal Democratic Party. And Trump took it to a, made it into a fine art. And that's still what's going on today. There's all this talk, Christina, about the Roe v. Wade being overturned and the changes in there with regard to affirmative action and how this new justice may handle big cases like that in the future. But a lot of the court's work, most of the court's work, as I understand it, centers on interpretation most often of administrative law. And that is where your area of expertise comes in. Explain what that is and how a new appointee might view that aspect of the court's job and that person's impact on those decisions? I think there are two dimensions to that question. The first is that a big chunk of what the court does is to interpret statutes, the statutes that Congress enacts. Um, and that then relates to what the executive branch does with those statutes. Usually questions of statutory interpretation come up in the form of a decision, an executive branch agency like the EPA or Department of Homeland Security has, has engaged in. And so the court both has, uh, the justices on the court have views about how to go about interpreting statutes. What has Congress actually authorized? Uh, some of those approaches to interpretation are uh, more generous and, and deferential and others, uh, frankly, impose the court's own view of what the statute ought to mean. And the justices are divided on the question of how much to defer, not only to Congress, but above all to the executive branch in the way that they implement the statutes, you know, social, economic, other kinds of, of statutes that Congress enacts. And I, I do think that one of the major legacies of the Roberts Court, and this is only accelerated with the Trump appointments, is going to be um, a range of efforts to constrain the power of the administrative state to act and to read congressional statutes in a way that hamstrings the ability of the government to respond to changing dynamics. I think if you look at the uh, vaccine um, or testing mandate case uh, where the, the court basically said that the Department of Labor, Occupational Safety and Health Administration did not have the power to require either a vaccine or testing of workers, uh, you see the suspicion of regulation, but it's filtered through an approach to interpreting statutes, which in this case was to say, Congress in the 70s couldn't possibly have meant to impose a vaccine mandate. But of course, Congress gave lots of authority to OSHA to protect people in the workplace. So which is it? Um, and yep. your theory of interpretation and your approach to regulation will determine which way you go. And, and the conservatives are going towards uh, less regulation, more constraints on the ability of the political branches to act. And yet the elephant in the room right now, Michael, is a re potential reversal of a decision on Roe v. Wade, which all three of the Trump nominees to the Supreme Court told Congress was settled law in their uh, testimony to Congress. Kimberly Whaley, a professor of law at the University of Baltimore School of Law, says the court is diluting the Constitution itself by refusing to respect Roe as binding precedent. Two courts, are they, uh, two questions rather, are they doing that? Uh, and how often in the past has the court reversed itself? Uh, the court reverses itself all the time. Uh, <laughs> Brown, Brown versus Board of Education uh, overturned Plessy. Um, the Supreme Court in recent years has overturned itself on issues involving campaign finance reform 
uh, the rights of individual workers not to join uh, labor unions. Uh, the court famously in the 1930s overturned earlier decisions uh, that prevented the government from regulating the economy in certain ways like minimum wage, maximum hour laws. Uh, it's not surprising that justices would disagree with decisions that they feel are egregiously wrong. Um, so I, I think that happens all the time. And it's, you know, they tell us that they're guided by precedent, but in fact, in every case, you have to make the decision, are you going to follow precedent or not? That's a big difference between the lower courts and the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court justices have to choose whether to abide by precedent. So I don't think there's anything wrong with them reconsidering precedents. If you think that they lied to the Senate Judiciary Committee, I think that's a that's a larger problem. But to say that Roe was settled law, I think is just a factual statement. It was settled law, and that's not quite the same thing as saying that you might not be willing to reconsider it. Um, I, we don't know what they're going to do. If you read the oral argument in the case, it's clear that there are five justices who would essentially overturn Roe and simply return abortion to the states. It's clear that Chief Justice Roberts would prefer a compromise position where the court upholds a 15 week limit on abortions, but leaves open the question of whether an abortion restriction like that in Texas, which applies at six weeks, might still be unconstitutional. What Roberts is trying to do is get one of the other conservative justices to go along with him. And I think many of us thought that Brett Kavanaugh might be open to that. But if you take literally what Kavanaugh said at oral argument, there's no doubt there are five justices to overturn Roe. The chief would prefer to avoid a headline saying Supreme Court overturns Roe, especially four or five months before the 2020, uh, 2022 elections, because it's hard to think of anything else that would mobilize Democratic voters and maybe push some swing voters into the Democratic column than overturning Roe, which would mean many states would return to a regime of essentially no abortion access. Obviously not New York and California, but many states. Adam, uh, most of what we've heard about the potential nominee that President Biden might put forward, uh, most of what we've heard has been simply that she will probably not have an Ivy League education. But the president has already put forth more than 40 people to appellate and district court judgeships. And from those, from those appointments, what, if anything, can be gleaned about the president's views on the kinds of people that he wants on the court and the kind of legal outlook or hope for a legal outlook he has in his nominee? Let me quibble with your introduction for just a second, okay. because I think probably the two leading candidates, two of the three leading candidates are in the classic mold of uh, Harvard College, Harvard Law School clerk for Justice Breyer, and that's Justice Contelan G. Brown Jackson, and uh, Harvard College, Yale Law School clerk for Justice Stevens, that's Leandra Kruger. But your larger question is really important. Uh, President Biden has been much more energetic uh, than Presidents Obama and Clinton in appointing people to the court and has appointed people who are diverse in many senses and notably in not only looking at former prosecutors, but uh, former criminal defense lawyers who are really underrepresented on the federal bench and, and on the Supreme Court. When we come back, we're gonna talk about the Presidential Supreme Court Commission of which Christina Rodriguez, our guest, uh, is a co-chair. Uh, and some of the things that they have told the president and others in this report, which runs 600 pages. We'll go through all 600 pages in the next 20 minutes. <laughs> when we come back on Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members at Duke Energy, investing in solar and other carbon-free sources to help reduce carbon emissions. More at duke-energy.com slash brighter future. Coming up in 20 minutes to 10 o'clock on 1A, what does love or why does love hurt? Jen White will speak to science writer Florence Williams, whose own heartbreak has prompted her to explore the connection between heartache and physical pain. What a great topic. It's Valentine's Day. And for Valentine's Day this year, you will hear why her story matters to anyone who has a heart. That's coming in 20 minutes at 10 o'clock on 1A. And we will continue our conversation about the United States Supreme Court 
of the commission that is looking into changing things at the high court in just a moment. Stay with us. Every week, WFAE teams up with the Charlotte Ledger to discuss business news, uptown property deals, for example. Land that trades, you know, get sold and bought all the time around Charlotte. But the thing that makes this the most interesting is that there's been a lot of focus recently on, you know, what's the future of Bank of America State? Kansas it's Bizworthy every Thursday on WFAE's Morning Edition at 644 and 844. Support for Bizworthy is provided by Sharon View Federal Credit Union and our members. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're talking about the Supreme Court, the possible nominee that President Biden will make, and now about the President's Commission on the Supreme Court of the United States. Adam Littak is with us. He's, he reports on the Supreme Court for the New York Times. Michael Klarman is a professor of legal history at Harvard Law School. And Christina Rodriguez is a professor of law at Yale and co-chair of the President's Commission on the Supreme Court. Uh, why did the president decide that he wanted to form this commission and what were you tasked with doing? I take it that question is for me. You, uh, yes, Christine, I'm I, sorry, yes. Obviously. I'll begin by saying I do not have any inside knowledge of what was motivating the president or what led to the design of the commission in this particular way. I think it's probably clear and, and the report intimates this that this commission would not exist had it not been for the blocking of Merrick Garland's appointment to the Supreme Court when President Obama tried to, did nominate him and tried to put him on the court. And it became an issue during the 2020 election campaign. And in order to not answer the question of whether the court ought to be expanded, the president said that he would form a commission to study these issues. And I think that's a reflection of how politically significant what the court is doing and what the re Republicans have done ha has become for the court. Uh, our task was not to try to resolve any of these debates, uh, but instead to inform them and to inform the president, the people who have actual political power to do something about the court, uh, principally um, the president and Congress, about how to think about the different kinds of reforms that are circulating in the public debate. And uh, there are a number of ways that we sought to do that, but it was not designed to come down on the side of any one reform, but to enable the people who have the power to decide whether to pursue reform to do so in, in a, a way that reflects some learning. In your report, you identify prominent proposals for reform, and then you evaluate them. How many different proposals are there, and how did your commission arrive at your evaluations? I think how many there are depends on how you count, but I would say there, there are three uh, sets of important reforms, or maybe actually four. Uh, the first is the question of whether to expand the court um, by two or four justices in order to shift the balance of power. The second is whether to impose term limits on Supreme Court justices they currently serve for life, should they serve for shorter periods of time. The third set would be a, a suite of reforms that are designed to reduce the power of the court in the system on the theory of the court is way too powerful in the way that it reviews democratic enactments. Um, and then we also took on uh, questions about the way the court itself operates internally, uh, because there has been a lot of attention in recent years to things like the court's emergency docket, uh, ethics rules, and things of that sort. Um, and we made decisions about what to include based on what was prominent in the debate, not just the scholarly debate, but the public debate in Congress and um, in, in the media. And those were the sets of reforms that, that we thought most important to address. Michael, uh, as the commission report states, there have been efforts to reform the Supreme Court dating back to the founding. I'm just curious, have there been similar efforts to report to reform other branches of government? Why is it always the Supreme Court that we seem to want to reform? Well, there have been efforts to reform other branches. Mike, if you don't mind, I just want to um, sort of thank Christina for her service. What she did was an incredibly public spirited and generous thing to do for which she's not paid and which I'm sure required a sacrifice of six to eight months of her professional life. So it's really um, quite an extraordinary act of public service. Uh, we've reformed the Senate. Uh, senators were selected by state legislatures 
for the first 125 years of the Republic. There have been efforts to reform the Electoral College really almost since the beginning, and it was reformed once after the debacle of the 1800 election when two candidates of the same party emerged tied, leading the, the election to be resolved in the House. There were efforts uh, for, for really 200 years to change to direct popular election of the president. A constitutional amendment to that effect came reasonably close to being enacted in 1970. It was passed in the House and didn't fall that much short of two thirds in the Senate. But the key is that was a time, and there's no good argument why the president should not be um, chosen by popular vote. But at that point, 80% of Republicans and Democrats agreed with the reform. And today, while almost all Democrats would do away with the Electoral College and pursue direct election, only about 10 to 20% of Republicans would do so because Republicans, only given the current constellation of political forces, this is not true everywhere and always, but in the current constellation of political forces, the Electoral College significantly advan advantages Republicans. Uh, Joe Biden won the popular vote by four and a half points and came very, very close, something like 43,000 votes in three states from being tied in the Electoral College, which means the election would have gone into the House and Trump would have won a second term. So there have been efforts to reform the Senate, uh, efforts to reform the presidency. The House was reformed almost from the beginning by being expanded. One of the main criticisms of the original House of Representatives by opponents of the Constitution was that it was only 65 members, which was a tiny body for the entire country. And it was reformed every decade until it became 435. And then it, that was treated as set in stone sometime in the early 20th century. So there have been other efforts to reform institutions. It's very difficult Adam, to do. Adam, you, you mentioned that the, the polls show that approval ratings of the Supreme Court are relatively low. What, what, if anything, do you know about how people feel about possible reform of the court? Are they in favor of it? Or is it just too esoteric for most people to understand? The proposal that polling supports the most is term limits or mandatory retirement ages. Uh, that is also not unpopular within the Supreme Court. Uh, Breyer has said publicly that he doesn't have a problem with long term limits. In fact, he might have liked the term limits so he wouldn't have to decide when to retire himself. Uh, the problem with term limits, and I defer to these constitutional scholars that, uh, that I'm on the panel with today, uh, is that it likely requires a constitutional amendment, which means it's probably a non-starter. So the reform that the public supports and that all, all of the rest of the developed world uh, has uh, term limits or mandatory retirement ages. So it's, sim it's simply good policy, giving people the opportunity to serve into their late 80s and then to decide when to retire under a president whose politics they share doesn't sound like a good way to run the railroad, but it's probably unachievable. Less popular with the public is what's much more achievable as a practical matter, which is changing the size of the court, which can be done by statute. Christina. I just wanted to follow up on something that Adam said about term limits. And I, I think that the commission did have internal disagreement about whether a constitutional amendment would be required. And one of I think the values of the report is in thinking through some of the implementation questions for reforms like term limits on which there is broad agreement across the ideological spectrum, though there is also opposition that we articulate. Um, I, I do think though that because changing life tenure to a, say an 18 year term would be such a significant change to the way the court has always been understood and constituted that it could be potentially politically destabilizing for Congress to attempt to do it through statute. Um, but the larger, there's a larger question too, or a larger implementation problem with term limits. And that is that if we don't fix the confirmation process, then term limits are not going to solve whatever problem they're designed to solve. Because if you have in times of divided government, a Senate that refuses just outright to confirm the nominee of another party, then you won't get the turnover and regularization that term limits are supposed to accomplish. You, you could come up with ways of getting around that if you amended the constitution to make an appointments process 
clear that it doesn't allow the Senate to obstruct. But if you don't proceed through amendment, then you have to address the problem that I think everyone now agrees that there will be obstruction um, by one party of another party's nominees into the future. That's where we are. And, and one of the things we could agree on as a commission as a whole was that the confirmation process is badly broken. And, and the report contains some reforms that were offered to the commission that we think are worth thinking about, even though we ourselves were not set up to reform the confirmation process. I, I want to talk about expanding the court, but, but before we get off term limits, uh, Michael, one of the arguments in favor of uh, lifetime appointments to the Supreme Court is that justices allegedly are insulated from the shifting winds of politics because of these lifetime appointments. In essence, we are to believe that because they cannot be removed, they will do what is constitutionally right. Are there any reasons that's not true? Um, well, there, there's good reason to protect the independence of judges, and you do that by not making them subject to reappointment by some political agency and by making it difficult to remove them through impeachment and by not allowing anyone to tinker with their salaries, which the constitution also provides for, but giving them fixed term limits wouldn't make them subject to any sort of political influence. So I don't think that introduces that concern. It solves several problems at once. Most importantly, the crazy system that allows justices to choose their own replacements essentially, which you would think a Republican form of government would never countenance. That's really kind of an aristocratic feature of the system. It also solves the problem of uh, fortuity that some presidents like Jimmy Carter get no appointments and some presidents like uh, William Howard Taft get five or six. It solves the problem of strategic appointments, appointing very young justices, which Republicans have been pretty successful at pursuing. So I, I think as Christina said, 18 year staggered term limits seems like an obvious solution, but it's not sufficient in and of itself. There have been, even before this commission was formed, people said that the next president, if he's a Democrat, should pack the court uh, by expanding the court. And you looked at that, Christina, on your, uh, on your commission. Uh, there have been past expansions. It has not always been nine members of the court. What did previous expansions come, uh, what happened in those previous expansions? Why were they allowed to happen? Uh, and what, what was the outcome of it? I think as the, as the report frames it, uh, each instance of past expansion or contraction for that matter uh, was for a mix of political and institutional reasons. There have uh, been uh, politically motivated efforts to expand or contract the size of the court. Not all of them have been successful. Uh, see most prominently President Roosevelt's attempt to expand the size of the court uh, in response to its resistance to his New Deal legislation. Uh, but the expansion of the court has also resulted from the need to have more personnel. Um, Roosevelt did try, in fact, to justify his uh, court expansion plan on those grounds. At that time, no one believed that that was true. But at other moments in history, as um, the country has expanded and as the number of circuit courts of appeals have expanded, the, the interest in having enough justices uh, to cover, so to speak, all, all of those courts has in part driven um, the, the expansion. And, and I would of course defer to the historian in our, our midst on these questions, but the commission's conclusion was that a mix of these considerations have always been in play, uh, but in the most prominent examples, the, the political has overshadowed uh, the institutional. Well, Michael Klarman, you testified in front of this commission and one of the, one of the things you talked about was uh, the expansion of the court because you say what you see is an immediate threat to American democracy by the GOP, the court's contributions to that, and advocating for court expansion. That's what you testified about. Share some of your thoughts with us. So I think there are basically two arguments for why Democrats ought to take the opportunity when they control all three branches of government to expand the size of the court. First of all, Republicans have already packed the court. Uh, when Justice Scalia died in February 2016, everybody thought that Democrats would gain a five to four majority on the court for the first time in nearly 50 years. Senate Majority Leader McConnell did something that nobody in history has ever done before, which was essentially to steal a Supreme Court seat. He came up with a rationale. We don't confirm justices in the last year of a presidency. 
PolitiFact regarded that as false, which is a nice way of saying that it was a lie. It was confirmed to be a lie when he rushed through Amy Coney Barrett a week before the 2020 election. So the court's already been packed. And even if you don't think it has been packed, anybody who's followed our politics for the last 15 years understands that Senate Minority Leader McConnell, when he becomes majority leader, will pack the court if he sees it as his advantage to do so. So it's not an argument against Democrats doing this that it will lead to a cycle of retaliation because Republicans will do it regardless. The other problem is that Republicans have this built-in advantage in the Senate and the presidency, which have enabled them to dominate the court, even though they've lost seven of the last eight popular votes for president, and even though they have not won a majority of the votes for Senate in any election cycle in the 21st century, five of the six conservative justices were appointed by presidents who entered the White House without a plurality of the popular vote, and four of the six were confirmed by narrow majorities in the Senate who did not represent the views of a majority of American voters. That's a pretty good argument for why Democrats need to fight back and rebalance the court. And you can't change the Senate, and you can't change the presidency, but you can change the size of the court by statute. But Adam, I have about 30 seconds left. Any attempt by Biden or any other Democratic president to pack the court, won't that make the court a more political institution than it is already seen as being? That's the argument. Uh, but as Professor Klarman wrote in the Harvard Law Review a couple of years ago, this may be a moment where we have to put those concerns aside. And given the real concerns that our democracy may be at risk and that this court is not going to stand in the way of those efforts, you, the argument would be that you need to do extraordinary things in extraordinary times. And Christina, what happens to your report? I'd literally have 15 seconds. What happens to your report now? Well, it's there for the president, members of Congress and the public to read. Our hope is that it will actually inform the debate over the long haul and that it will be a, a resource for, for decades to come actually. Christina Rodriguez is the uh, co-chair of the President's Commission on the, the Supreme Court. She's a professor of law at Yale. Michael Klarman, professor of legal history at Harvard, and Adam Liptak writes about the New York about the uh, Supreme Court in the New York Times. Charlotte talks with Mike Collins is a production of ninety point seven WFAE. Support for 